Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us in the Harvard Chan studio, and to our global audience who has joined us on uh, who's joining us online. My name is Akila Johnson, and I am a health reporter with the Washington Post, and I will also be our conversation facilitator this morning because I really hope this is more of a conversation than a dry panel discussion where we just lecture to you for the next hour. Um, and so this panel is the fight for equity, reforming healthcare systems from within and the event is presented in partnership with the Harvard Public Health magazine which devoted its entire fall issue to structural racism in health and so it is part of a year-long series that is designed to explore challenges facing public health and so today's conversation is about how structural racism impacts our nation's health and our panelists came not just to talk about the problems, but also about the solutions and how we can close racial health gaps in efforts to dismantle medical racism or racism in healthcare. And so joining me in the studio today is Linda Villarosa, who is a contributing writer at, to the New York Times Magazine and author of a wonderful book that those of us in the studio have copies of called Under the Skin, The Hidden Toll of Racism on American Lives and the Health of Our Nation. Efren Flores, Associate Chair equity and community health at Mass Brigham Enterprise Radiology. And next to him is Kedar Mate, President and CEO of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And at the end, we have the next generation, the future of healthcare. We have Lash Nolan, a Harvard medical student and founder of We Got Us Empowerment Project. So thank you so much for joining us today, you guys. Are we excited? Oh, yeah. So excited. We're so excited? Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Because we are going to have a really important conversation. And so I think if the past, I don't know, what, three years has taught us anything, right, the summer of racial reckoning, and I put that in quotes because I don't know if we have fully reckoned with racism yet, but the summer of racial reckoning um, and the COVID pandemic is that we all enter these conversations about race, racism, equity, with kind of different understandings of definitions of what those words actually mean, um, different lived experiences. And so if we are gonna talk about solutions, if we're gonna talk about problems, I think we all need to kind of have a shared vocabulary for how we are entering this conversation. So I'm just gonna start with some, I'm gonna start here and this is, I want everybody to answer, right? How would you describe, how would you define medical racism and then how would you also define health equity? Well, thank you for <laughs> that question. Um, medical racism is what happens to um, black people, other people of color in the healthcare system. And it has to do with what happens in society and then what happens when we enter the system itself. Um, and then health equity, medical equity is really something we don't part, the part that we don't have is healthcare for all. We don't have a kind of healthcare system where everyone has access. But then even for those who have access, Health equity means that once you enter that system, you get treated fairly and you get treated justly and you get treated with um, care. And I just wanted to uh, briefly add to that that you know we were talking about health equity and and how do uh, one size does not fit all. Right? So there are things that we can do to tailor. So how do we tailor care for our patient and that's when health equity really comes through that how do we make sure that everybody has a fair chance to get the best outcomes and achieve and so we can deliver the best care possible for everyone. And, and to me, when we think about uh, racism or structural barriers or structural um, systemic barriers in, in healthcare, I just think about the many faces of discrimination and hate where it could be racial and ethnic minority or it could be uh, people experiencing uh, physical disability or anything. So the way uh, uh, we la let things um, insinuate in our healthcare system so different people experience different outcomes and worse outcomes than others that when structural racism or discrimination really uh, blends into particularly uh, again, um, among racial and minority um, populations. Perfect. As we get further down the line, it becomes harder and harder to add something new. <laughs> I so, have faith. So, I have faith. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's okay. But, but I, 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 will, I will do my best uh, to add a couple of dimensions. Um, I think that medical racism includes a combination of both conscious and unconscious biases. Um, we're very familiar with overt forms of racism when they take place, the sort of conscious, intentional acts of uh, violence, I might suggest, um, uh, deliberate forms of racism. But there's a tremendous amount that uh, I'd, so I'd venture to guess the vast majority of medical racism is 
uh, unconscious in nature, where we don't actually know it or see it or understand it fully, that we're even exhibiting it. And to some degree, all of us have biases. All, uh, not some degree, all of us have biases. And how they get expressed in the medical environment is what constitutes medical racism to me. Um, health equity, I, to, in a word, if I had to pick just one word, I think it's justice. Um, and um, maybe if I added a couple additional words, I would say in the healthcare ecosystem, that it's the opportunity for all people to realize their full health potential, uh, but particularly with an emphasis on those that are both historically and presently marginalized. And I think we use this um, saying a lot, historically mar marginalized, as if it is not happening mm -hmm. currently. And I, so I always add that notion of both historic marginalization as well as present and current um, marginalization and oppression. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said, and I think that when I think about medical racism as well, I try to remember the fact that racism came before race. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the medical institution was not this bystander while racism was occurring in society, but they were actually at the epicenter of it. So I think about different physicians and contributors to public health, um, such as Samuel Cartwright, Marion Sims, like all these individuals who played a direct role in perpetuating harm. And when we think of medical racism, I think that those individuals and the science that we produced that allowed um, humans to be exploited for capitalistic gain, that's how I frame and think about medical racism. In regard to health equity, I think that it's important for us to consider the fact that every patient has different barriers to get to that health clinic. So whether it's their challenges with getting transportation, um, their challenges with having someone in the room advocating for them in their health, and all of those things are directly linked to medical racism. So I think when we, when we frame health equity, it's about what are the ways that every patient is having a different struggle, and once you get in the clinic, what are those struggles that are being perpetuated by medical racism and mitigating those harms? Perfect. Thank you all so much for, for helping to set the stage. So we, we all kind of have a common understanding of where our panelists, when they, when they use these terms, what they mean and kind of and, and, and how we can collectively engage in this conversation. And so to do that, I, 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 wanna, I want us to take a minute to hear kind of a patient testimonial. So this is a woman who I met while I was on assignment in Alabama. Her name is Alexis King and she's a mother of two. Um, who experienced these really painful symptoms for years. She had you know, painful and heavy periods, adult acne, weight gain, mood swings, facial hair. I, I mean, and it got so bad, she doubled over in pain one day at work and ended up in the emergency room, right? So, she, and, and it had been going on since about 2008 after the birth of her second daughters when she really knew something was wrong. And it took until 2016 before she was finally diagnosed with PCOGS or poly, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I just want us to hear a little bit from Alexis about her experience. I had always had irregular menstrual cycles since the time that I started having my menses um, at 12. So that had always been like an issue but no one ever like said, hey, your irregular cycles could be related to polycystic ovarian syndrome. And then they also were really heavy cycles. Like we're talking, I'm bleeding like, seems like gallons of blood for seven days. She still never like went that extra mile to like say, well, let's see why your periods are so heavy or let's see why your cycles are so irregular. Let's see why you keep having these, these pain episodes. Cause you know, mind you, I did have that one major pain episode at work, but like I would have a cycle and then like maybe a week after my cycle, I'm hurled over my bed in pain. And I'm communicating this to my doctor like the whole time because I'm very self-aware about my body and just my emotions and everything. Fast forward to maybe 2016, I just decided I was going to change doctors. I just need a second opinion. So she was like, okay, well, let's send you down to ultrasounds. The ultrasound tech actually says, hey, have you ever been diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome? And I'm like, what's that? I go back down to my doctor's office and I'm sitting there. And that's when I finally got the polycystic ovarian syndrome diagnosis. 
one thing that I did find out in my research um, after being diagnosed with the PCOS is African-American women actually suffer more with PCOS than any other race. So just knowing that, um, I just wish <laughs> the original doctor would have taken the additional steps. Um, I don't know. I, I just kind of have mixed feelings about that because it's kind of like you, you have to wonder, did you not take those additional steps because of my race? You have to wonder, did you not take those additional steps because of my race? I think that's just a really poignant way to end that clip. And it also kind of helps frame the conversation that we are having. And when I heard her say that, it made me think of something that you, Linda, talked about in your book when your father was ill and you went to go and see him. And I'm just wondering if you can talk us through a little bit about how you the way you dressed, the way you spoke, the things that your that your mother kind of asked you specifically to do in terms of a way that black patients, patients of color, try to mitigate that exchange with their physician to say, well, maybe they will treat me different as a result of my race. How can, how can I enter into this kind of medical atmosphere and, and, and mitigate the harm that I may possibly experience? Mm, that um, clip was so moving and so angering. Um, when my father was ill, my mother, I was living in, in uh, New York and my dad and my mom were in Denver and my mom called me and she said, your dad is ill, he needs you to come. And she said, dress up in your best business suit and put your New York Times business cards in your pocket. And when we got to the airport, I said, what is going on? She said, your dad is very ill and they're treating him like an N-word, she said the word. And when we went there, my dad, who was impeccably dressed, he's trained as a bacteriologist, he is soft-spoken, was very upset. And he was um, in a dirty gown, his hair was in disarray, he always kept himself really, um, his hair really nice. And um, he was shackled, I thought, you know, restrained to the bed, because he was very upset. And I said, what is happening here? And we realized that the, he was just not being treated well. And I was in shock. And what it took was my mother and I going to home, getting his medals from military service, getting pictures of him before he was ill, explaining to them that he was trained as a scientist. And if they talked to him in a respectful way, and if they treated him respectful, he wouldn't be that upset. But it was also like, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to play this respectability card just to get the care that this person that we love so much deserved? I mean, and so, you know, Keter, I know you think a lot about systems, right? And redesigning systems. And so as we are, you know, Alexis's clip, what Linda has just discussed, talk to us about how the system has failed in this instance and how would you redesign a system where equity is at the center so you don't have patients who are having to do these types of things? Well, there's so many in, in the clip from Alexis and in your story, Linda, there's so many moments in, those, in, in both of those stories uh, where the system is not doing what it's supposed to try to do, you know, treat people with dignity, respect, know and understand what matters to people. I think the sort of first and foremost lesson of all of our work on equity is that system design needs to start with an understanding of what truly matters to the patient in front of them. Mm -hmm. And in, in her case, it was getting an answer to her question around why am I doubling over with pain and being as diligent and thorough as possible to get to an answer on that. Now, we're not always gonna find an answer on every, on every challenge or problem that we face, but having a system that's built around understanding what matters to people and then reacting to it and responding to it with dignity, respect, and the development of trust. And not just letting that be something that happens by chance or because you happen to have a particular physician or a particular nurse who happens to be on the ward or on the, in the clinic on that day, but building that into systems so that it becomes a reliable part of our practice, which is something that we just don't have right now in our systems. You know, um, you hear a lot of talk about anti-racism training, right? And so would anti-racism training help in a situation like this? Number one, what is it? You know, would it help? How does it make better doctors and how does it improve patient outcomes? Slash yeah, um, so 
when I when I talk about anti-racism training, I try to compare it with implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. And I feel like implicit bias training is to help you understand the different biases that you might have toward certain groups of people. But oftentimes when I've gone through implicit bias training, it just stops there. And I feel like everyone in the room is like, wow, I have these biases, but what do I do with this information? Anti-racism training is actually starting to understand the socio-political structures in place so that you're aware of these things that are happening so that when you see that patient who is a black person, you're checking yourself. Let me make sure that I'm going through in my mind. Am I making sure that they're, they're well treated? Um, am I making sure that they're getting the, the care that they deserve and need? And what can I do to help mitigate the challenges that they're experiencing as a whole? The, the interesting thing about medical training, and as I was listening to Alexis's story, is we already learn from the first day of class that whiteness is the standard in medical education. So I remember when I first learned how to do CPR, the folks came in and all of the mannequins that we were learning to do CPR on were on white mannequins. Then as we were learning about how to recognize different skin illnesses on, um, in dermatology, Again, all the representation was on white skin. So if you are only learning that a white person is your patient, when you go out into the real world and you meet Alexis, you don't know how to start to process and think about those biases that you have. So I think that that is, is what shows up in the data where black children are less likely to get pain medication compared to white children. Um, you think about the, the stories of people like Serena Williams and people kind of dismissing her pain as a, a, a superstar and celebrity. And it just makes me think about Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, mm -hmm. and how blackness in this country is something that puts you in a caste system. And no matter how you dress it, no matter if you are you know, the editor of the New York Times or a writer for the New York Times, um, you still have to deal with those challenges. And I think it does start with our medical education and, and how we're learning about these issues. I wanted to quickly add that, you know, when, when we, a um, couple of things that all have touched on is like um, the, how do you build trust and trust is not built overnight, right? So there's, and then also how you have to see more than just each patient encounter in silo, but more so as a continuum on the healthcare journey for our patients. So like when she was talking about different encounters and and when could she would have, um, she could have had a different process or intervention w that could have made her health better. And we don't think about, we think about uh, the specific moment, but we don't think about how each touch point with the healthcare system or how I'm impacting not only the moment with the patient, but also downstream journey as well. So we have to think about systems when we are collaborating across to improve that into last point. Um, there's a lot of people that not only recognize bias and want to get involved, but it's like, how do we make it practical? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't become more of a checklist or one more thing to do. Well, for example, if I talk about the healthcare system, everybody, you know, um, BC, overburned, uh, burnt out is a big issue in healthcare, so they, they don't want to feel like they are doing one more thing, but you have to think about how do we really have equity become part of a of the um, fabric of the DNA of everything that we have we are doing on a daily basis and then not see it as something else but also as a way to improving the outcome for the patient but also to contributing to societal um, well-being and really achieving social justice so one more step in towards that direction but we got to give people uh, practical ways to do that because if not then we lose that sustainability we, um, in the implementation of things that we're doing. So when we're thinking about, or in our group, like last night, we were having a presentation discussing health equity in radiology, how to get it done. People were asking, so what we talk about words matter. So when the way that you even address people, in your case, with your with your father, and, and unfortunate um, events, and the way that we think about how do we perpetuate with our words uh, stigma, stigmatizing mm -hmm. language, but also language that erodes trust in the healthcare system in society then we have to, um, we can even start with their, their just with words, and then that will allow us to have a more open dialogue in, in how to make it better. You want to jump in, go ahead. I yeah. do, I want to just say one other thing, based, uh, building off of what Efren and, and Lasha just said, because I think anti-racism training allows us to see things that we don't necessarily see. I was talking about unconscious bias earlier, and you know, I trained on the same mannequins, you know, when yeah, I was yeah. in medical school, right? And, and, but when I looked at those mannequins, I didn't see it. I didn't understand that that was a problem, mm -hmm. you know, when I trained. Um, I didn't recognize that all mm -hmm. the skin presentation was on white skin and that that was a problem in my dermatology classes. What anti-racism training 
that I now have taken, the books that I've read that Linda and others have helped uh, us to see, that's helped me to understand where my unconscious biases are, what is normalized for me or has been through my training and through my practice. And now, with that new understanding, it allows us to start intervening. It allows us to start changing those systems. It allows us to demand mannequins that aren't mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. color. It allows us to ask for things like dermatology presentations on multiple different skin types. It allows us to challenge stroke present, you know, why is there a disparity in stroke presentations and how we treat patients with congestive heart failure. Like those kinds of things where we just accepted them as system truths. We accepted them as part baked into the, f the fabric of how we train and how we work. And now with the advent of anti-racism training and us actually understanding that, we have a new shared analysis and that helps us to see past that. And then, and then just briefly, as I know we have to move, but one thing that I wanted to add is that really puts blinders. Mm. So in the medical care for the patient that you were presenting, when we're thinking about um, um, polycystic ovary syndrome, when she was talking about she having this issue after her second child, the first thing that we think about, at least the way that we're trained, is that people with P, um, PCOS can, uh, can be, uh, have, have children. So then, you know, my stigma or my stereotype of that type of patient is that would, she would have be not been able to have any kids. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. they can't. You can mix it. So it just, um, it's just an example of how these stereotypes really create blinders. So and then al don't allow us to open and um, explore this uh, with a more open mind. And same thing with structural barriers and like, for example, like Lash talking about the mannequins and like how we do in medical education. So really have to think, think about how. Th everything is insinuating into our everyday recognizing that so we can take off our blindness and really deliver better care but more so you'll become better as a society well you guys are kind of teeing up the next topic of conversation <laughs> so that's why don't worry about it i was letting you go i was like yes keep going keep going i like this but i want to talk about institutional inertia right mm -hmm. so you've talked about um, you know, Kedar like, pushing for different for different mannequins, right? Like, let's let's push for this. You know, Efren talking about let's not just go through the checklist. Oh, another thing for me to do: checklist, checklist, checklist. <laughs> how how do you? And I mean, even I know some of the feedback that I've gotten from mm -hmm. you know when I when I write stories. Um, Doctors can be racist. I, I believe there was an editorial recently to that extent, right? Doctors can be racist. This is, we're talking in biology, we're doing science, this is hard science, we're not dealing with all the rest of this stuff. So how do you address that? How do you begin to ch change the hearts and minds of colleagues, um, you know, who are with you on the floor, who are over administration, over the purse dollars? Like, how do you begin to to deal with institutional inertia. And Linda, I know you talked a little bit about this in your book at one point in time. So I'm gonna start with you and then we're gonna mix up the conversation. Well, I'm gonna start with um, one thing I've seen is medical students like you, Lash, trying to make a difference, trying to be a different generation of doctors, nurses, midwives, health policy um, folks. And I'm really impressed by that, but I'm also worried that why are, you know, when you're trying to get your education, you're also doing the work too. Mm -hmm. And that, you get tired. You get tired of doing that, and that's not fair. On the flip side, I'm impressed by the work of Dr. Mary Bassett, who used to be centered here, um, changed our health department in New York City by, you know, basically mandating anti-racism training and also policy changes but to all 7,000 employees of the New York City Department of Health. Now I'm having big hopes for her because she's now our state you know, health commissioner. So I think one thing is not putting it on the shoulders of you know, students themselves and also it has to be a policy that people have to take part in because it's the right thing to do. I wanted to add that um, change is difficult. Nobody likes change, right? So if I ask the audience here, how many of you had a, a, or every day, how many of you have a coffee every morning, the first thing, I'll raise my hand, right? So that's a ba daily basis, <laughs> like everybody that does that, right? So that's our, our <laughs> daily practice. And the same thing for changing system when we're thinking about um, changing what we do, on a, it is not easy, right? So if I say, I'm gonna have my first coffee at three o'clock, that I may have issue with that. And the same thing for, People when they use in systems, particularly when you talk about um, inertia in the systems, and um, more so, just changing culture is not an easy thing to do. And but and when we talk about this, um, and I'll talk about in in the health system, there are a lot of emotions and, and opinions about 
this, right? So I'll never win an argument about, um, about feelings or opinions. So we look at numbers, and I think data allows us to have an objective conversation to say, okay, so I think this is the way that we should be doing it, or you may have a different opinion about it, but then these are the numbers, these are the patients, these are the gaps in care that we are experiencing. How do we do better? So then finding a common ground to have this conversation more as a dialogue and to try to build partnerships with people because it's not going to be easy, particularly if we want to make a significant difference. If we don't work together, we're not going to be uh, doing this. Uh, Linda talking about, like for example, like how um, students like the next generation, or I would say the future is now with LASH, right? So like people that are really the driving care, moving us forward, and but also how do we come work together so we um, do this and it's not falling on, on on some people and really the the way to for us to significantly do this is to uh, really come together but um, part of the work is whether we like it or not even if we do research or clinical care gonna be an advocacy component mm -hmm. so we have to recognize that in our daily practices and then but also when I um, tell trainee medical students college students medical um, or residents in radiology to get involved I say like there are gonna be some battle scars along the way but um, just to let you know where um, you have a community that is supportive of your work, you're not alone. And, I, and that to me is really critical for us to meaningly, meaningfully advance that. So the, to understand that you're not alone in this work and how do we build community. And for example, all five of us here coming together from different areas and having the conversation really focus on this just show that the, how critical it is to form community, but also how we all come from different lengths and trying to advance a similar mission. But beyond advocacy, I'm sure you have some yes. ideas too, right? So this like is what we do. So the, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, <laughs> the organization I lead, it really specializes in change mm -hmm. management and changing systems specifically. And you know, one, mm -hmm. one lesson that I've learned over the years of working on change of any kind, and specifically this kind of uh, and, and maybe even more so with uh, the anti-racism and health equity work that we're doing now, is that we have to expect resistance. Mm -hmm. um, resistance is not unusual, it's to be expected, and, and honestly, if we're not meeting with resistance, we're probably not pushing very hard. We're probably not doing what needs to be done with especially this kind of work unless we're meeting some kind of resistance. The other thing is that we've learned is that resistance is not always bad. Mm -hmm. Resistance uh, implies energy, it implies uh, a passion, a feeling, a sentiment, as you're saying, that's actually quite a demonstration of engagement with the issue. It, it comes as resistance to begin with, but that resistance can be converted into enthusiasm and support with things like presenting information. Uh, I'll give you one very brief example. We were working with the health system in the Pacific Northwest, a group of emergency room doctors. Uh, they uh, did not believe that there was a, a racist bone in their bodies. Mm -hmm right, that sort of notion. Mm -hmm. And w when we looked at the data on black patients and white patients who came to the emergency room presenting with the same exact signs of, of stroke, the black patients got clot-busting medications 20 minutes later than white patients mm -hmm. across the board, across their entire uh, health system. And that 20 minutes is the difference between long-term disability, sometimes mm -hmm. early mortality, mm -hmm. and something as important as a stroke. And when, they when we presented that data to them, they went through the usual stages of grief around data. The data are wrong, the data aren't mine, the data <laughs> are you know, somebody else's, the data aren't a problem. But eventually they worked through the information, gained confidence around it, and then realized that this data was theirs, it was a problem, they needed to do something about it, and they did. And within 11 weeks, they had narrowed that equity gap entirely mm -hmm. because now they were in engaged in passion. They'd gone from resistors to engaged in impassioned change agents, and that, project has catalyzed the entire system across the board to start moving in every clinical department around health equity because they can now show that it was possible. Mm -hmm. That this notion of, of racism baked into our systems was actually changeable. They could improve it and make it different and better. So change is possible here, I guess is the short, <laughs> short answer. <laughs> Change is possible. Yes, ma'am, you have something to add? Yes, Go yes, for it. I do, I do. Well, first I just want to say thank you for like all the appreciation for the, for the young generation coming up. And I would not be here if it were not for the work of folks like Mary T. Bassett, Aletha Maybank, Michelle Morris, like folks that I just look up to so much in the space. So I just want to like give them their flowers. Um, and also all the folks who have created this data that we have about health disparities. And on that point, I just, I think that where we need to go and around this inertia, we love to study racism. We love to produce data about racism, but we still have not moved toward incentivizing action. 
I'm more incentivized to produce papers about the community and the different challenges that they're experiencing mm -hmm. than I am creating an initiative to actually address those challenges. And it's embedded in the way that we think about promotion. It's embedded in the way that we think about the H index. What would it mean for us to take a step back and actually prioritize the needs and wants of the community to really practice equity instead of focusing so much on how much data can I produce about the struggles of the communities that we're talking about? The other point I'll make is that I think that we need to tell the truth. And right now, across the country, we've seen critical race theory be outlawed in over 10 states. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a similar trend in medicine where people are very resistant to talking about the history of racism in our institutions. So I think that telling the truth is what's gonna first get us there. Mm -hmm. And this summer I did a program called FASBI where I spent two weeks in Poland and Germany um, basically learning about the history of the Holocaust and it's an ethics fellowship um, and what I found so interesting is that their medical students are learning about the history of euthanasia at the spaces um, where a lot of these harms were being committed. Um, at early on in their, in their elementary school education, they're learning about the history of the Holocaust. And it's just embedded in their education that they're learning about their history. But here, we're trying to just make the first attempt to do that, and there's this resistance. And I think that that's really going to be key to kind of getting rid of that inertia is we can't be afraid of the truth, and we can't uh, study our way out of racism. Mm -hmm. You all have said a few things, and I want to talk about data, because each of you have mentioned data in some way. And I think, right, the COVID pandemic has shown the importance of data, like how it can, how it can help um, change things, right, illuminate things, but also just the deficits that we have when it comes to health data that is disaggregated mm -hmm. by race, ethnicity, and all of the other ways that health data, I feel like, probably needs to be disaggregated and just collecting it, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we're still thinking along the lines of anti-racism training, not studying our way out of data, presenting data to uh, help kind of as a mirror, how do you reconcile that, right? How do you reconcile the moments where folks just don't want the data? We don't have the data, we don't have racism, but we need the data to say that there's racism, right? So like, how, can, let's unpack that a little bit. Well, there is a lot of data. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are <laughs> saying, we need more data. I was like, no, we don't. <laughs> we don't need more data. Plus, listen, people's stories are a form of evidence, mm -hmm. especially as That's they true. pile up. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. listen to folks, they're telling you what's going on. Okay and listen to them. But you don't need any more data. You can, I can give it, I'm a journalist. I can give you some data. <laughs> There's a lot of data here at this institution. Mm -hmm. So there is a, sorry, sorry. No, there is a form, I think, of data paralysis. Mm -hmm. You know, like we, analysis paralysis, or whatever the uh, moniker is, where we, where we try to study our way out of problems. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not gonna work, you know. I heard a term admiring the problem. Yes, and that's, <laughs> that's a little bit of what it is. Uh, so I think there, there, is a, there is a certain amount of information. Data can be very compelling to, to leadership, to folks who are resistors, as I was describing earlier. It can help us um, to convince people to join us in this work. And that data can come in the form of quantitative information or as you're saying, in fact, I think it has to come in, in both forms. Mm -hmm. It has to come in stories like Alexis's story yeah. with the story of your father and yourself. And without those stories um, to, to accompany quantitative information, we also have a loss. We, we also won't have movement building, which is what we fundamentally need to change the narrative around this. So I think it, both are necessary, but we can't get trapped by it. Mm -hmm. And so we have to move through the stages of gathering enough information so that we are documenting a problem when it's present and start mm -hmm. to work on it. And that I think is that, that sort of transition from understanding enough of the problem and that there is a problem to getting to work is where I think connecting with communities really matters. Because communities, when they see enough evidence, are gonna demand action. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where the uh, power of partnership with communities who are affected by those, uh, whatever the harm is that we're talking about, uh, is so powerful. It happened in patient safety. We connected with patients uh, who had been harmed and when we got enough information about those harms, we connected with the community of patients who were harmed, and that mobilized the national movement around patient safety. A similar thing, I think, is happening now around health equity. Yeah, I wanted to say, like, the data really allows us to tell a story, the story that is untold uh, for many um, high-priority communities, and that's something that, you know, for example, one of the uh, reasons why we um, encourage people to publish their work is more than just the academic um, 
glory or anything that you get from it, really to allow uh, uh, to build a platform so you can have the, conver the objective conversation. So you put in the example and you're talking about the Pacific Northwest and how presenting the data, really it was hard to face, but also it allows them to um, do meaningful change to improve outcomes for everybody. So you have to use that not only to recognize where are the gaps, but also how do you implement and get small wins. So it's the small win will get you to a larger win and then really try to move that inertia that um, for systems. I, that's something that will encourage others to get involved, but also move us uh, forward. And then the other thing I wanted to add is that definitely there's opportunity to combine both objective and anecdotal data. So mixed methods, when we think about research and like collecting um, anecdotes and really understand like from qualitatively, how do we use that information to not only understand where are pressing issues, but also how do we use that to inform how do we deliver better care for our patients in every in, on our daily basis. And that's something that we need to do more in order for us to reflect how, um, to, so our system reflects the community that we serve and then how we better serve our patients overall. So let's talk about the communities, right? That, that let, let's go back to the community. So, and, and I want to talk a little bit about um, how racism and the stress of racism, right? We've talked about the effects that it has on the healthcare system, right? And kind of the, some of the barriers could put in. But let's talk about the physiological effects of that, right? And so like how that affects patients when they are walking into the exam room, right? When they're walking into radiology, when, when you're examining them, when we're talking about strokes and, and hypertension and diabetes, um, and the stress and how all of that is coming with them into the exam room. And is that stress appreciated enough in within the healthcare system? And how does it need to be appreciated if we are really going to start closing some of these gaps and if we're really going to be to begin to address health equity? Efren, I'm gonna start with you. Well, so <laughs> the, what you're um, discussing, it, re it reminds me of one of my uh, colleagues and mentors, uh, Dr. Uh, Ruth Carlo, who recently published uh, an article about social genomics and understanding, and particularly for breast cancer, and understanding how the stressors outside the healthcare system not only um, impact the patient on the outside, but also uh, how, how allostatic load and all those stressors really um, increase um, mutation of the, of the cancer and then results in worse outcomes. So there's a lot of interest, an increasing interest in that space on understanding the direct impact of all the structural barriers into health outcomes directly. Um, we saw with COVID that how the social, more than your magnifying glass into the high priority population on ra uh, racial ethnic minorities that were suffering worse outcome, but also it allows us to understand the direct impact of um, structural barriers and systemic discrimination um, on um, health outcomes. And that's something that we need to, as you know, we're here in the School of Public Health, really understand that we need to develop better uh, linkage and bridges between the healthcare system and the public health sector so we can address some of those factors outside, don't see them as discrete silo, but more so as a continuum for, uh, um, for our patient's journey. Maybe one way of thinking about this, there's a, an individual level of how this might manifest and then a population level in which this might manifest. So I think, you know, adverse childhood events, uh, allostatic load, uh, challenges that people experience, simply accessing care um, at different stages of life. Um, and that would create, it would imprint itself on our, or we're, we're starting to understand how it imprints itself on our biology uh, as an individual. And that is something that we're only, I, I would say, at the surface level, still, we're still scratching the surface of really understanding how it has an impact and then responding to it with treatments that are not just uh, treating the consequences, but trying to go a little bit upstream in the pathway, the causal pathway to try to address some of the causes. At a population level, this also manifests. I remember in the 90s at some point in San Francisco, there was a San Francisco Health Department tried to do a viral load for HIV across the city of uh, San Francisco, and they did community viral load. And the whole idea was to try to understand how the HIV virus was affecting different communities differently. And what they found is what you might expect. You know, communities where you had a higher concentration of historically marginalized or presently marginalized peoples were had a higher plasma viral load than, than uh, communities that were more affluent, generally whiter, et cetera. Um, and so that notion can also translate not just at the individual level, but at a whole population level. And then again, there are different treatments. How do we bring the kinds of social supports, uh, community supports, engage the, 
uh, and, and this gets bigger, poli you know, local politics, how do we mobilize at a, at a whole system level rather than at an individual patient care level? That's a different set of levers, not always controllable by the individual you know, doctor mm -hmm. or nurse, but at the level of a whole city or state sometimes or county. Linda, why do you think we're just scratching the surface? I mean, you've been reporting, investigating these issues, and that's been part of your work for a very long time. So why do you think it, 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 it still feels very much like we're just kind of scratching the surface on some of these issues? Because it's really hard. Okay. I was thinking yeah. about that community viral load, and I remember that, and I thought, that is so wonderful. But also, when people grab a hold of that, then they're like, oh, this community mm -hmm. is, are the vectors of mm -hmm. HIV. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then right. also the people in the community themselves feeling like, oh, w they're blaming us for this you know, mm -hmm. national problem. Mm -hmm. And so this is hard. So if you don't do both things, if we don't have the anti-racism training that says, don't blame people for their problems, look at the system, then you know, when you're doing this stuff that is, can be you know, it can go the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. You just have to be careful with it because we haven't done the work mm -hmm. as a country around these issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll just add, add one other piece to, to the, the stress of, of being a patient in our healthcare system as a black person, a person of color. Um, I think we think of like the medical institution as like a, a healing institution, but for some community members, it's actually a trauma. Mm -hmm. Like people don't want to go. Like there are folks who might be having stroke symptoms or a chest pain that's been going on for you know months or weeks, but they're like, I really just don't want to deal with it. And me personally, anytime any of my family members go to a doctor, I tell them to FaceTime me. I'm like, I don't care if I'm in class, if I'm in clinic, FaceTime me. Just because I'm afraid even of the challenges that they might come across being a black woman within our, our healthcare system. So I think that that's very real and we have to remember the fact that, you know, there is a, a lot of baggage that comes with, you know, showing up. Just showing up is in itself is a, is a struggle for many patients. You know what happened to me recently? I was listening to this conversation, it was sort of healthcare providers on one side and then community people and patients on the other. And you could hear the healthcare um, providers going, we just need access, access, access. Mm. But then the people in the community were going, wait, once we get in, we need to be treated well. Mm -hmm. We need equity, we need equality. And it was this kind of strange disconnect because mm -hmm. it wasn't the same conversation. It's interesting, so as we're talking about, right, like disconnect in different conversations, it, it brings me to a point that I wanted to talk about, which is the hierarchical nature of medicine and how the hierarchy that exists within the healthcare system is it a, is is it a hindrance or like it you know is it a hindrance is it a harm or does it help and so i'm thinking of when it comes to birth outcomes right we know that women have better birth outcomes if they have a doula or a support, a support person there right the importance of community health workers or, or promotors and just some of these folks who did not go to medical school but who are health workers who help make huge differences in patient outcomes, you know, medical assistants, um, the person at the front desk, you know, who were not the doctor who comes in for that short amount of time. Talk about that role, the importance of that, and how the role that they have in helping to close gaps and disparities and to help advance equity. Because so I think you've all touched on it in different ways, but I'm just wondering if there is a better way to kind of more add more structure and more rigor to that. And then, you know, pay people what they're worth because we also need to talk about reimbursement and funding at some point in time, too. Well, so my initial thought about that, I was thinking immediately about, so California Medicaid, mm -hmm. speaking of payment and policy, but California <laughs> Medicaid has just uh, begun authorizing a couple things. One, they're gonna pay for undocumented immigrants, which is kind of an interesting development. That's the first Medicaid program in the country that's doing that. And the other is that they're starting to pay for doulas and community health workers and other other sort of uh, other care providers that have not been traditionally covered by the Medicaid program. And the, that, that's a good thing uh, because it allows people to see people from their community as they come through the doors of the institution, you know, be welcomed by uh, a different cadre of staff. Um, but it also has a downside risk. And the downside risk is that we, in, in many cases, OBGYNs and uh, mid midwives are still requirement, are still necessary to produce safe delivery. And in some cases, relatively uncommon, but there are birthing situations in which you need an OBGYN, you need a hospital. And what the risk is, is that 
by covering so many other uh, ancillary uh, support staff, we might not have enough resources available to cover OBGYNs and nurse midwives. Now, I don't think this has to be an either or. I think it can be a both end. We live in a country that's wealthy enough and can support a both end solution to this. But there is what it's being, uh, the way it's being uh, administered today is as a trade off. Mm. And I don't think that poor communities or resource limited communities or marginalized uh, and historically oppressed communities should have unequal treatment in a, in a new way uh, than what we've done before. So it, it, I think both and are necessary. We need nurses, uh, nurse midwives, OBGYNs, doulas, and community health workers to help address and build birth equity in our communities. Mm. I wanted to briefly add uh, to you talking about the hierarchy and you're building off on he was saying is that you know, what we're trying to do here is empower patients and community, whether we're resources, whether um, we um, access, just truly understanding that everybody has uh, contributed, coming to the table like we're having here a conversation today, contributing equally here, but also that the voice, uh, whether the community or the patients are really heard and that incorporated in, their, in the healthcare system moving forward because the problem is that um, there's, a, as you mentioned, there's a disconnect with what we think we should be doing and what the community needs. So uh, some um, a colleague of mine, we were having a, a webinar recently, we were talking about, he was mentioning the, the concept about um, health equity tourism. So they're talking about mm -hmm. uh, disparity research and then mm -hmm. doing um, research on a certain community, but then how do you give back to the community or how does the research that you're doing impact the, the care moving forward for that community and that, that the disconnect that sometimes happens because we tend to come from a prescriptive approach instead of an inclusive approach where we're truly forming partnership where we're coming together and co-designing, co-learning that um, that better system moving forward. So community, we talk about uh, community-based participatory research or CDPR and it's more so about community-based engagement. So when, when I talk to patients, I, I tell them so we're, um, we're, you are the captain of the ship and we're the, the crew, you are the one that makes, uh, ultimately, you make the decision to take the ship where you want to. And, and our goal is to get to that dock, which is better health for you and better outcome, but ultimately you make that decision and we're here to support you and that's the way that we should be uh, creating systems in a way to supporting patients, but also empowering patients and their community to achieve that ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. So we've got like 10 minutes left. I'm going to do slightly lightning round from viewer questions. So Lash, yes. what are three things that you think can be done within the organization to address racism? Within the organization, yeah. like like the medical institution? The, so like within, no, let's not, let's not go global, like within okay, the okay, local, okay, like within we your <laughs> institution, like, you know, without uh, getting you in trouble. Like, right, give me three okay, things. Okay, okay, here we go. Um, so I think the, the first thing that needs to happen is that it has to be a collective imperative. Um, and when I say that, I'm meaning anti-racism training, commitment to community. So it can't just be that there are certain groups of students who are learning anti-racism, but I think our attendings need to be learning anti-racism training. I think at the hospitals we're training at, um, from the greeters to the CEOs, they need to know that there is an over 20 year difference in life expectancy between Roxbury and Back Bay. I think that we all should be learning the same thing so that we can be on the same page. Um, the second piece is we need to change our incentives. Um, I don't think that we should be pushing to just publish papers for the sake of publishing, but how are we making sure that that information gets back to the community? Can we think novelly about um, having community members on um, re review boards for research, et cetera? So I think that that's something else that we should be doing. Um, and then the third thing that I'd say is that there needs to be some system for accountability. So if something racist was said in class, if there's a slide uh, where we're showing how something presents on a patient with darker skin or a patient with lighter skin, are we making sure that we're also learning how that looks on darker skin as well? So um, there just needs to be like some type of accountability from the time that we're learning in our, in our preclinical education and also beyond once we're actually in the hospitals. Good job. So Kidar, if you had to determine what are truly important qualities needed for physicians and others to be successful in medicine? Like if we're changing the system, what are the qualities that are truly needed to So I, to re I think we used this? to think that we should hire clinicians and physicians for intelligence, IQ. Okay. Um, and I think we should be moving on from IQ to a combination of IQ, yes, it's important, but CQ, curiosity quotient, and most importantly today, empathy, EQ. Mm -hmm. I think that notion of, of uh, understanding what matters to the community, to your patients, no matter who they are, when they come through the door, that's who we should be placing into the exam rooms. Um, that's who we should be empowering with the tools of modern medicine. 
those uh, clinicians that are going to be deeply empathetic to patients, families, and communities. Good job. So, Efren, do you have any specific recommendations for reforming graduate medical education from within, especially those at academic medical centers? It's a reader question. Well, so. <laughs> Viewer <laughs> question. I would say that um, something that, it, um, when I think about graduate medical education and that we don't do enough. And it's also, it seems like um, more like a volunteer work is really engaging with the community. I think that that's something that, you know, if, um, if we want to keep the finger on the pulse of what is truly happening, we have to engage with our community. One of the reasons why I truly, one of my favorite parts is really talking to people in the community outreach events and just even being here and having this conversation because it really allows us to listen with curiosity, but also um, being deliberate in uh, listening with intention and understanding how this is not a criticism, but understanding how do we infuse that. So I would definitely would encourage um, people to engage in the community, not seeing like a community, for example, like in medical school when I was, and the community engagement part was like doing a volunteer clinic in medical school. Actually, that should not be volunteer, that should be part of the curriculum, understanding, incorporating uh, patients, like we heard before, our patient story, because those narratives are the ones that will allow us to tangibly understand how the systemic barriers are impacting our patient, incorporating that into medical medic or any curricula. You were talking about lash in, in terms of like, when you went um, in the summer look, looking at uh, you know kids from elementary school going to understanding the um, effect of the Holocaust mm -hmm. moving forward. And that's the way that it sh we should be doing that type of learning out in the community, understanding how systemic barriers have impacted everything that we do our daily life more than your healthcare. It really how this is reflected in everything that we do, from um, getting stopped by police, from getting uh, through security in the hospital, to getting to security here. Like, how do we understand? How do we do that? Um, and how this is impacting our patients' life, and then that will also allow us to better build not only a um, more welcoming environment for our patients, or in general, but also a more understanding healthcare environment when where we can focus on healing and patients can focus on their health and instead of like all the barriers that are outside impacting and really fragmenting our care. So we've got like four minutes left and I want to end on a slightly hopeful note <laughs> if that is possible as we're talking about this, right? So Linda, as we, you know, the summer of 2020, the ra summer of racial wa reckoning, um, the pandemic really kind of push the gas pedal when it comes to health equity, right? Like I feel like now everybody is talking about something that I mean, has been a core part of, of your professional career for decades. How do we keep the momentum? How do we keep this momentum going? Like, how do we sustain this so that this is not just the new shiny object of the moment? And then in five years, if, I feel like we're going to be, you know, starting back at scratch and square one and having race 101 conversations again. I think what I'm personally doing is trying to do is supporting the people doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, especially medical students like you. I'm teaching pre-med at, at the City University of New York. And I think the students came in and they were like, oh, we know what this is gonna be about. And I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we went deep into sort of where these racial stereotypes come from. And I remember their shocked faces. Then we watched Aftershock, about mater the movie about maternal mortality. They were really surprised. We're doing, um, I'm teaching them how to interview like a journalist. Mm -hmm. I was like, you are gonna ha be having these conversations with patients. You need to be like me. I'm a really good interviewer. And I love that kind of training. And then finally I said, you also are gonna be harmed by this process. Mm -hmm. They're almost all students of color. And I said, somebody's gonna look at you because of your religion, your accent, your skin color, and think you're not a real doctor. And I want you not to give up or be totally demoralized. The system isn't fair to anyone, in, including you, even though you have such wonderful intentions. And also lift up the stories of patients. Lift, so people don't feel like it's my fault. I am the only one who this is happening to, like your patient here. And it's like important to do that and to say, no, we hear you, we see you, and we want it to change. Efren, how do we sustain this? 30 seconds, how do we sustain it? Building community, um, building on, on small wins and really supporting each other. I think that that's really the way that uh, moving forward. Kedar? 
Yeah, results. I mean, I think we've seen, we've managed to get results in small pockets. It's the most in energizing thing. We're changing the narrative around what's possible. This doesn't have to be the way it is. Inequity is not our destiny. <laughs> Equity is. Um, I would say first, don't be a health equity tourist. Um, if this was not work that you were doing before and you're trying to come into this space, think about how you can uplift those who've been in this space for a very long time. And second, keep that same energy. Um, if you were tweeting, creating mission statements, creating task forces after the murder of George Floyd, what are you doing now to make sure that you're holding yourself and your institution accountable? This was such a good conversation. Thank you all so much for spending your morning with us, for sharing your insights, for your expertise, and just being open with the conversation. I want to thank those of you in the studio audience who were here for your energy, uh, for your laughter, and for your openness. And for those of you who were watching online, I want to say thank you to you all as well. Your questions were great, and we really appreciate you all spending a little bit of your morning with us. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>